as you've heard today um, from many of the speakers, um, and as you know um, from your own experience, potassium has a big role uh, in periodic paralysis. And so I wanted to sort of just review potassium and what it's doing in the body and what's controlling where the potassium is and what are the levels and how does that relate to either primary periodic paralysis or secondary forms. So the first thing I want to remind all of you that potassium varies a lot over time. It, you know, that's normal. It bounces up and down. In fact, that's me. So when I went for routine follow-up and had my electrolyte panels, that's my potassium over the past couple of years. So it fluctuates. That's the first thing to recognize. The second is where is potassium within the body? So on your left uh, is, a, is a cartoon of skeletal muscle cell to remind you that in every cell in the body, potassium is much, much higher on the inside as compared to the outside and in the blood. I mean, the ratio is like 35 to one. It's huge, 35 times more potassium inside the cells. And so muscle is the major body store of potassium. You have a little bit in excess of 3,000 milliequivalents of potassium in your muscle fibers. That's where most of it is. On the other side of this diagram on the right, is meant to show the blood vessels and the spaces between cells out in the tissues. And uh, in this extracellular space, the blood only has something on the order of about 20 milliequivalents of potassium, and the interstitial fluid another 50 milliequivalents. So, you know, 150 times more potassium inside your muscle than inside the blood. And you have to keep this in mind when you think about potassium supplements, replacement, how can changes in potassium occur, and how might that relate to shifts in and out of the muscle uh, compared to uh, what you're ingesting or what you might be losing uh, in the urine? So again, 98% of the total body is uh, total potassium is inside cells and a very very small proportion in the blood that you're measuring. So the next thing to consider is, okay, not only where is the potassium, but what's controlling how it comes in and how it leaves. So we've heard a lot uh, this morning about dietary sources of potassium. And uh, in the normal diet, there's something you know, on the order of about 80 milliequivalents a day of potassium. This is not without taking supplements or anything else. Of course, for the potassium to remain in your total body to remain relatively constant, what goes in must go out, so you lose about 80 milli equivalents of potassium a day. Most of that is in the urine, a little over 70 milli equivalents, and the remainder um, is in the stool. So that's maintaining the balance. But you should also realize that um, this small purple box in the center, the extracellular fluid in the blood, that 70 milli equivalents that you would measure with a blood test is not only influenced by what comes in through your gut, through diet and what's leaving uh, out through the kidneys, but also the shift that's occurring back and forth between inside of cells and outside of cells. In fact, that is the dominant regulator of what your extracellular potassium is. Much more powerful than what you take in or when you've most recently gone to the bathroom. And sort of in fine print under there, so the blue box on the top, which says ICF or intracellular inside the cells. That's, that's the muscle compartment, that big blue box on the top, talking with the little purple box, which is the, the potassium out in your blood. And so you can see there are different influences, many of which we've mentioned today, that promote that shift back and forth. So uh, for example, uh, if your blood potassium is low, your body has compensatory mechanisms that is going to cause potassium to come out, out from inside the cells um, more prominently. Or if you become dehydrated, potassium is going to come out of the cells. Or if you exercise a lot and have a higher acid content in your tissues, potassium is going to come out of the, cell, out of the cells, primarily the muscle. So the, the, the point is when you think about this reservoir, the intracellular space and muscle, that you know, has hundreds of times more potassium than in the blood, this is the big dog in the game, right? It's the intracellular stores and the shift back and forth. And it's important to keep this in mind 
when you think about what occurs during an episode of periodic paralysis, as you just heard from Dr. Chukrilin and I've mentioned before, the periodic paralyses that are associated with abnormal potassium, that's not because your body has a problem managing potassium or you don't hold on to enough potassium or you're losing too much potassium in the urine. It's because of um, electrical disturbances that cause potassium to shift and be in the wrong place. So in hypo-PP, it shifts and it gets trapped into muscle. And in episodes of hyper-PP, it's just the opposite. It's shifting out. So we've also heard that there are a number of things that affect, that can either be triggers or might help uh, ameliorate an episode of periodic paralysis. So I thought, rather than just saying, you know, exercise does this or uh, ingesting sugar does that, let's actually look at some of the numbers. Um, and so these slides, both of them are showing on the vertical scale, on the y-axis, is, is how much potassium is in the blood uh, over the time course of minutes. And let's start over on the left. This is the potassium level rise that has occurred with extremely vigorous, high-intensity exercise. So the point I want to make is that you can see the potassium went from four all the way up to eight or, or up to uh, six and a half. So the change can be large and it can be fast with intense exercise. So I just want to illustrate how potent these activities are in comparison to taking 20 milli equivalents of potassium by mouth, for example. And the, the slide on the right is a review article that uh, summarized the changes. So that's not the absolute potassium on this graph on the left. So the numbers look really small. That's because that's the relative, the, the uh, increase, not the absolute level. So you can see the increased uh, the serum potassium concentration by you know, anywhere between one to four milliequivalents per liter with exercise. So exercise is certainly a very potent way to rapidly increase the potassium in the extracellular space. What about the opposite? And I apologize, this is a very busy slide that I took from the literature, it's not mine, so I'll try to just walk you through it. The bottom line, what we're looking at here is that carbohydrate, when you ingest that sugar, how low is that going to drive your potassium? All doctors agree that effect occurs. And in fact, if you go into the emergency room and your heartbeat is irregular because your potassium is high, the first thing they're going to do is hook you up to an IV and give you glucose and insulin because that will make your potassium go down very, very quickly. So there's no doubt that the phenomenon occurs, but it's kind of an interesting question just how prominent is this? So this was a controlled exercise study. These individuals, um, these were healthy young men, um, were given 75 grams of glucose in 300 mLs of water. So that's about twice the amount of sugar that's in a can of Coke, a 12 ounce can of Coke. So they're taking this at time zero, they're recording things um, uh, for uh, about an hour and a half here. And you can see at the beginning of the graph, the, the, the vertical scale is showing the blood potassium. It starts at around four on average, and it doesn't change very much, interestingly. But when they start exercising, and each vertical gray bar is a period of a burst of exercise, and you can see there's a separation of two lines. There's a dotted line that's a little lower with the open inverted triangles, and the black symbols up above. That separation is the, the black symbols are the ones who didn't drink the glucose, the sugar before starting exercise, and the open are those who did. So over time, and also coupled with combining carbohydrate and exercise, there was a substantial decrease, but it's, it's on the order of about uh, 0.7 you know, to one milli equivalent per liter. So that gives you a sense of what might be happening with carbohydrate ingestion by the numbers. Now, of course, what's important to you and what I emphasize, it's what you experience. So you as an individual, are you very sensitive to carbohydrates? Do you need to totally avoid them? You know, that's what you need to do to best manage your own health. But this is what happens on average to young, healthy male athletes uh, when they take a, a, a carbohydrate load uh, and then uh, exercise. Another interesting question is, what's happening to your potassium level on a daily cycle, night and day? You know, many processes in the body have this diurnal variation. And so um, this study, it was done in the Netherlands. They uh, recorded from a large group of, again, normal, healthy individuals. Um, all the early studies were always done on men. 
And what you're seeing uh, on the panel on the left there, it's the uh, venous potassium in the blood uh, over the 24-hour uh, period. So it's, it's starting at about 8 o'clock in the morning at the far left, then it moves through the day. The potassium is at a minimum around midnight and then starts to rise again overnight uh, just before you get up. So I found this to be fascinating because, you know, you would probably think just intuitively, if you're not eating overnight, your potassium is going to be lowest in the morning because you haven't had anything to eat. But interestingly, there are a lot of hormonal regulations relating to cortisol and insulin signaling and other things that are happening, which undoubtedly is responsible for this, uh, you know, sinusoidal oscillation. And you can appreciate those dots are showing individual measurements. So there's a lot of noise. And, you know, if you take a big slug of KCL at night, you're not going to follow this pattern. But I just wanted to point out the amplitude, you know, this is on the order of about, it's really only on the order of about, you know, 0.3 milliequivalents per liter. It's small, but there's a variation that occurs um, throughout the night and day. So uh, I promise I didn't get together with all the other speakers, but I got to go back to the story of bananas because everybody wants to talk about bananas and the best banana story for periodic paralysis was one that was given by Jake Levitt uh, several years ago, and it's in his document, Periodic Paralysis 101, that's on the website. And I completely agree with this, and I love this slide, so thank you, Jake, I'm showing your data again. So he reminded us that the average banana is seven and a half inches long, 180, 118 grams, so that's about 12 milli equivalents of potassium in one banana and that not all of it is necessarily bioavailable to be absorbed. That same banana, I don't know how ripe it is, so I didn't consider that question until this morning, um, has 28 grams of carbohydrate. So that's a lot of carbohydrate you're getting with that um, potassium. And that if you think, you know, in a severe attack, when you really want to protect yourself, you take 20, 40, go up maybe to 80 milli equivalents of potassium as an initial loading dose, You'd have to eat six bananas, and you're not going to feel good after eating six bananas. So, um, you know, the point being, bananas aren't the panacea, and you heard lots of great ideas, you know, apricots, avocados, sweet potatoes. There are lots of things that have uh, high potassium content with complex carbohydrate, which means the sugar load would be slower and delayed. Um, so don't necessarily just reach for a banana. Uh, the other point that Jake made that I think is nice to review in this context is when you're taking potassium supplements in, in milliequivalents, in liquid form for fast absorption, what should you expect? And again, this is young, healthy adults. And so basically, on the range of 40 to 60 milliequivalents, uh, within a half an hour or so, your serum potassium will probably go up by about on the order of one milliequivalent per liter, just thinking about that. And if you go way up, you know, close to 150 milli equivalents, it's going to go up significantly. You know, I would say that um, to go much more than 100 milli equivalents per liter, especially, you know, if you're accustomed to it and have had levels checked in the emergency room and you know you can tolerate more, that's fine. But if you're new to this or it's the first time you've taken 100 milli equivalents of potassium because of an attack, if you're still not getting better, go get your potassium measured because you're, you're just getting into the point where you could, you could be um, at, at risk. So I want to now think about potassium and how it relates as we've talked today about several of the different uh, forms of periodic paralysis and try to unpack this and, and think about why the potassium story, although important, is not always clear or consistent and how to deal with that and to understand what the limitations are. So, you know, we've been contrasting several times today in different talks, hypo versus hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. All of us still agree potassium has a huge influence here. It's just you have to be aware of the variability that occurs and that can impact the interpretation and the recommendation of what to do. So first of all, the first horizontal line there is to remind everyone that the expectation is between attacks, when you're not in an attack, your potassium is most likely going to be normal. It should be normal. Periodic paralysis is not a potassium homeostasis problem. It's a problem with excitability of muscle. So it's expected to be normal. That 
Um, uh, during attacks, spontaneous, if you have a spontaneous attack in hypo-PP, your K might be low, but it may very well be normal. We've been emphasizing that a lot. That doesn't exclude the diagnosis. That doesn't mean this isn't a real attack. That's part of the biology. Similarly, for hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, the level might be increased with a spontaneous attack, or it may be normal. What's more consistent, more consistent than measuring the blood potassium with a spontaneous attack, is your response when some other outside influence, some provocative maneuver, to change the potassium. So if things occur that would tend to decrease potassium, such as a, you know, a carbohydrate and insulin load, or a massive bout of diarrhea, or something like that, that will more consistently bring on an episode of weakness in someone with hypo-PP than the potassium being spontaneously low. So the triggers are sort of stronger influence. And conversely, things that would increase potassium, fasting for a long time, big adrenaline rush, uh, I'm sorry, not big adrenaline, big um, potassium load from uh, diet uh, could aggravate uh, hyperkalemic periodic paralysis for sure. So where I wanna go with the rest of our time is to think about that second row, your potassium during a spontaneous attack. Why might it be normal sometimes? Because that's confusing to your doctors who are trying to help you and get confidence about the diagnosis. Or how can that help you understand management of your symptoms? If I can still be weak when my potassium is normal, why am I bothering with all this in the first place? You know, if, if, if I'm still susceptible to these episodes of weakness. So the short answer is these are all hypotheses and reasonable ideas um, still trying to gather a level of proof. The first one is the issue of timing. So there can be a big difference between when you start becoming symptomatic and when that blood draw actually occurs. So you have to be at home. Um, gee, is this is an episode bad enough that I want to go to the emergency room? Oh, am I going to take potassium or not? Oh, I got to get through triage. Oh, they have to verify my insurance. Oh, I'm waiting for the doctor. to. It's three hours later, and they draw your potassium. Okay, so there could be a disconnect temporally. The other is the location of the potassium. So I mentioned here, you know, it's compartmentalized. Some is in, in the, inside the cells, some's out in the tissues. There can be differences between what's on the arterial side and the venous side of the circulation because potassium gets taken up in the vascular bed through muscles. So it's possible that the potassium that's being measured from your venous blood draw is quite different from the local potassium in the tissues of your muscles, out in the muscles. So there could be that distinction. Another influence is that we know there are other ions besides potassium that influence the risk of this abnormal running down of your battery and being refractory and losing excitability of muscle. And we showed, we were investigating the mechanism by which exercise, and especially rest after exercise, may cause weakness. And um, we talked about this a couple of years ago. I don't want to dive too much into the details, just to show this is our mouse model of different forms of periodic paralysis. On the vertical scale, you're looking at muscle force. We take the muscle out of the mouse and can very carefully measure uh, the state of contractility of that muscle. And over the course of 80 minutes there, what we're doing is every two minutes, we measure what's the maximum contraction of this muscle. It's initially very stable. Then we change the pH, make it acidotic. All the mice tolerate that pretty well. And then the pH goes from 6.8 back down to seven. That, that means you're recovering from acidosis. That's like the end of exercise. And you see the blue and the magenta symbols, poof, this big crash in muscle force. Those are the two hypo-PP mice. The hyper-PP mouse doesn't do it, the wild type doesn't do it. That whole experiment was done in a bath with very carefully controlled potassium at 4.7 the whole time. So I am convinced, biologically, you can have a change in your level of force because of other things going on. Shifts of pH, which influences chloride and other things, even though your potassium is rock solid. So to me, that means it's no surprise that sometimes even when you're strongly symptomatic in the emergency room, your potassium level might be normal because there are other players that go into this. Potassium is a major player, 
but it's not the only player. All right, there's another um, reason that this one's a little bit, you gotta put your seatbelt on for this one. It's a little bit esoteric, but it's a really good explanation if, if you're willing to bear through me with a couple of slides without a pointer. The bottom line is, this is a hypo-PP story. There's really good science that says, yes, a very low potassium is gonna trigger an attack, but that science also says the potassium that you have to replenish and where you have to get back to to recover is actually much higher. So there's a difference in what triggered and what recovered. The fancy name for that is hysteresis, and that's why your potassium may be normal. At the risk of losing everybody, let me just try to take you through this. So we go back to our friend the muscle and being able to measure that battery. How well is your muscle polarized, ready to fire this electrical wave and tell contraction to happen? So here's the normal state. Uh, again, lower down in this diagram, it's, uh, it's uh, how well your battery's charged, voltage on the vertical axis, down means you're better. And during an attack of periodic paralysis, um, what's happened is your battery's partially run down. So what I'm gonna show now with that same concept, is your battery run down? Question is, what's your state, status of your battery, that resting potential for someone with hypo-PP versus an unaffected individual when you begin changing the potassium. So now we're gonna look at this a slightly different way. There's your battery on the vertical scale, and I put some reminders there. If you're down lower, you're excitable and your battery is polarized, it's charged. If you go too high, it's discharged and you can't do the signaling and you get paralysis in the gray box. Now we're not looking at time on the horizontal axis, we're looking at the potassium in your blood. So there's a crazy curved trajectory of the relationship between how well your battery is gonna be charged and your blood potassium, this is what normal muscle does. And you can see over most of the range until you get really, really low, your battery is well charged. Here's what happens with someone with hypo-PP because of the ion channel mutation and the leaky channels. This relationship shifts to your right, and so you'll see what happens is you're gonna to begin to get in trouble. Suppose we're starting out with four milli equivalents per liter potassium. You're happy, your muscles are happy, your batteries are charged. Those round circles, the battery is charged on a wild type person, the battery is charged if you have hypo-PP. Both of you have normal muscle contraction. Now, something causes your potassium to go down towards about three. Maybe you, you had a Big Mac or something, or um, Whatever, your potassium goes down, look what happens in a normal individual. That gray circle moves down to the left. Your battery is better charged. You're fine, your muscles are fine. The red circle falls, it hits that corner and goes up high. That's an attack of hypo-PP. That's the paradoxical running down of the battery that occurs all the time. Well, what's interesting is now what happens when you begin to replete the potassium? So the gray circle comes back up to where you started. We come back to four, and the normal individual's fine, it's still strong. The person with periodic paralysis, you're stuck up in that gray box. This curve all relates to the way these channels and things, you come, you have a beer with me, I'll explain it to you later tonight. But that's how all of this happens, okay? You need to go higher, and eventually you can fall back down onto the lower curve. So you need to have a higher potassium to get back to where you started. That's the phenomenon of hysteresis. But you could clearly understand, sorry, how you could be in the emergency room with a severe attack of periodic paralysis and your potassium is four. This is how it can happen. I'm, I'm convinced of this. We've, we've demonstrated it uh, in our mouse models. All right, in the remaining uh, six minutes, I want to go to the topic of secondary Periodic, periodic paralysis, uh, hypo and hyper. Interestingly, you don't see too many people attending this meeting with secondary periodic paralysis. The punchline and the reason is the electrolyte disturbances are usually so profound and the underlying causes with kidney disease or something else is so dramatic, there's no question about what's going on. So you're not, your journey is over. You're not trying to understand why you have episodic attacks a week, so you're not ending up at this meeting. But let me, let me talk to you about it because the question comes up. And a lot of people wonder, well, I don't have a, an ion channel mutation, but my potassium is sometimes not normal. Do I have secondary periodic paralysis? So that's where we're going. So as a disclaimer, as we start this topic, 
I have uh, to comment, and you heard from uh, Dr. Chakilin that the most common cause of episodic weakness in association with low potassium is thyroid disease, thyrotoxic periodic paralysis. Statistically, by far, way outnumbers the number of primary cases of periodic paralysis. And these individuals look a lot like hypo-PP. They have low K during an attack of weakness, the triggers are the same, even the long exercise test can show the, show the same changes that happens in hypo-PP. The big difference is they have too much thyroid hormone at the time. So they have a high resting heart rate, might have a lump in their neck, um, you might have some hair loss, you know, uh, diarrhea, all kinds of things going on. Interestingly, this disease has a huge male predominance, 50 to one gender difference, and a strong predilection for those of Asian descent, particularly Japan, uh, Korea, and China. This is where most of the cases of thyrotoxic periodic paralysis uh, are in the world. And if you treat the thyroid disease, the risk of paralysis goes away. It's cured, it's completely gone. So that's why those people don't come to this meeting because the thyroid disease is easily recognized with a blood test and um, it's short lived and then the, you get the thyroid corrected and you come back. So what about other secondary hypo-PP? So you start in our crazy diagram here with the, the trajectory of a, of a normal person and yes, even in a normal person, if you make the potassium low enough, less than two over there, eventually you fall up into that gray box of uh, lack of excitability and weakness. But as indicated in this diagram and as happens in real life, you need to have an extraordinarily low potassium uh, in order to have an attack of weakness if you don't have primary PP. So primary PP is here uh, in the red by comparison. So for example, this is a paper in the medical journal from 1960 that looked at a collection of patients with secondary uh, hypokalemic periodic paralysis. The column I've highlighted in pink is their potassium values, which on average was 1.7. Okay, really, really low. And what's usually happening here in the kidney disease, there are other problems, so the bicarbonate's low because they have renal tubular acidosis. It's the most common cause of hypokalemia this low. Oftentimes it's secondary to autoimmune diseases like Shogun's syndrome, things like that. But again, a very obvious uh, renal problem that's causing low potassium and um, there's um, a, a deficit in total body potassium. So you, these people need truckloads of potassium to get back and out of one of these episodes and have the renal situation corrected. So just comparing here uh, in the two columns, primary familial hypo-PP versus secondary. So as we've heard, in primary PP, your K may or may not be low for all the reasons we've mentioned. In secondary PP, if you're symptomatic in the emergency room, your K is extraordinarily low or you don't have secondary hypo-PP. That's not what you have. So it's, it's not a diagnostic mystery. Lots of causes of secondary hypo-PP a uh, whole list of different kidney diseases where you're uh, losing excessive amounts of potassium in the urine. There can be massive GI loss from diarrhea or bypass surgery uh, or things like that. When the weakness is occurring with secondary hypo-PP, there are almost always changes in the electrocardiogram uh, because uh, your potassium is so low that your heart isn't happy either. You can have secondary hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. It's not uh, as common. Um, but it can occur that potassium, just like in the case for hypo, is very high, usually over seven milli equivalents per liter in the venous blood. Um, the EKG almost always shows signs, uh, elevated uh, T waves in the, in the electrocardiogram. And again, it's not a primary muscle problem. There's issues with the kidney, renal failure, chronic renal disease. You could have um, uh, Addison's disease or adrenal insufficiency, medications excessive uh, potassium supplements or um, aldosterone antagonists like Inspra could do this as well if taken in excess. Here's uh, examples of cases. What I wanted to point out, large series of cases in the medical literature, again, most of the causes were from the kidney, but when you look at this uh, table on the right, it has the, uh, it's bracketing the potassium levels during the attack. Over 75% of these patients in the emergency room with weakness from secondary hyper-PP had a K greater than eight, okay? 
So again, secondary hypo-PP doesn't come with a K of 3.5 or 3.2. Secondary hyper-PP is not 5.5 or 6. These are extraordinary and would not be missed in the emergency room, which is why um, these people don't tend to come here. So I will leave this slide, which is a review slide, because um, I want to stay on time. We've talked about all these things. You can just use that or take a picture and, and remember this, and that's a little cartoon of a potassium ion flipping around there. But otherwise, uh, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you very much. OK, I'll try to beat the rush. These are people that have actually dialed in earlier. I have hypo KPP calcium channel mutation R528H. I have also been diagnosed with myotonia based on three EMG tests, including one by Dr. Toil. I have not been able to find the myotonia mutation. I recently did the whole genome sequencing with sequencing.com, but do not understand the results. Can you suggest who I might send the results to for analysis? Sure. Um, happy to answer this question. It goes a little bit away from potassium, but it raises an interesting point that's relevant. So hypo-BP, R520H mutation in the calcium channel, the most common cause, probably accounts for almost 60% of genotype people with hypokalemic periodic paralysis. No question there. The abnormality is myotonia. Myotonia is excessive electrical activity with muscle at rest when it should be quiet. There are a lot of ways it can show up as an artifact. Dr. Tawil is a very experienced neuromuscular specialist. If he called it myotonia, it was probably myotonia. There can be secondary, we know um, in some families, chloride channel defects are there, um, and that is a definite risk for myotonia. When you have the sequencing result, what you're looking for is a missense mutation or a small deletion, but not all of the gene screening techniques would see if there's a huge deletion or wiped it out. It just won't show up. So there are other, I would, the first thing I would suggest is a deeper dive into a possible secondary chloride conductance problem that's going along with this. Because from my understanding, the R528H alone in the calcium channel shouldn't cause myotonia. Okay, thank you. Would you like to ask your question? Good afternoon, doctor. Um, I've got a quick question. I keep hearing about weakness, weakness, weakness. I have hypo, I've been, um, diagnosed with chronic hypo, and I suffer, it's uh, been over almost three years now, and I have fatigue, excessive fatigue. For years, I thought it was my Epstein-Barr coming back. Then I thought maybe I had Lyme disease, nobody would test for it. Then I had a recent hospitalization, about a being chronic. But I, like, right now I've been fighting for the past hour to try to stay awake, just ask this question of you, and then I'm gonna try <laughs> to take a bit of some shut-eye because I am fighting and it, this happens every day. It could happen in the morning, in the afternoon. What is the difference between the weakness and is the fatigue a consideration or not? Great question. So this gets into a little semantics about uh, how words like fatigue and, you, and weakness and paralysis are used in common conversations and how they appear in the medical uh, literature. Um, where I thought this was going to go, and you can correct me, um, some people use, would use the word fatigue when you're still able to function, but it takes additional effort. You're not at 100%. Um, and that can be mental fatigue. It can be physical exertion. In terms of the exertion, um, with well genetically confirmed cases of hypo-PP, um, especially for females and for people uh, generally after age 20 or 30, the episodes can be much longer lived, weeks to months, and I'm sort of functioning at, at 80 or 75% full strength. And so whether someone wants to call that weakness or fatigue could be an issue of semantics, but it can last a very long time. And one of the things that really brought this out dramatically was back in the 1970s when Birch Griggs and the colleagues were trying um, acetazolamide for, they were trying it for hyper-PP because there were no loop diuretics available then. They were trying to promote um, loss of potassium in the urine. And what they discovered is that people who thought they had permanent weakness or didn't realize that they weren't at 100% went on a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and all of a sudden things just brightened up for them and it was like night and day. So long-winded answer to say, 
you know, established diagnosis of periodic paralysis, I have something that I would call fatigue that lasts a long time, that doesn't have episodic attacks. That could be just a chronic, not quite as good as you could be. And so I would still think about optimization through either potassium supplementation or carbonic anhydrase inhibitor as something to explore. This one comes from the audience from earlier as well. My 35-year-old son is in the process of being diagnosed with uh, PPP. The symptoms appeared out of nowhere several months ago. His neurologist did genetic testing and said his was not passed hereditarily, but a mutant gene that started with him. He's active in the military. Apparently, that can be a risk factor. Dr. Cannon, have you seen this correlation before? He's waiting on his appointment with a neuromuscular specialist at the University of Utah. Yeah. So a couple of points there. First of all, as you've heard, uh, age in the 30s would be unusual, not impossible, but less typical for um, experiencing the first symptoms of periodic paralysis. Not unusual to get the first diagnosis of periodic paralysis because people go for decades unrecognized. Uh, so if the symptoms didn't start till 35, that's a little unusual, but not impossible. And the second point is the genetic testing, which apparently shows a variation in him, but not his parents. And there are many, many well-documented cases of so-called de novo or brand new channelopathy, periodic paralysis, because a mutation occurred in the formation of the egg and the sperm, or the sperm, one or the other, that neither parent had. And so that has happened multiple times, and there are many examples of that in the literature. So that's why the absence of other affected family members does not absolutely exclude a diagnosis of periodic paralysis. It makes it less likely, but it doesn't exclude it. So. Thank you. This is also the last one from this morning. I, I'm a 64-year-old female. My question was prompted by your mentioning the RY, RYR1 gene and the extreme rarity of this case of hypopp. I had my first attack of paralysis at age 44. Since I have, since I have had an excess of 165 attacks, which are, which are each full body paralysis with only eye movement. I've done gene testing twice, no gene confirmed. I have clinical diagnosis hypopp. My question, could I perhaps have this RYR1 gene and is there gene testing for this? Yeah. So I think part of that story was that part of your journey was to have been tested and nothing was found. So if the test was the panel from Invitae, your RYR1 gene was already screened. And if it was screened twice and there were no variants, that, that question has sort of already been answered. And I, I completely empathize and understand the desire. I'm searching, nobody can figure out what this is. And then you key on a few words. Oh, these RYR1 cases were unusual because the onset was really late. And, it was, and you think, well, mine was really late. You know, but um, it's, um, again, because she's already been screened twice and nothing was brought up even as a variant of unknown significance, I think it's going to be something else. Okay. Where can parents go get genetic testing who don't appear to have periodic paralysis? I missed the very last phrase of the question, sorry. Sure, where can parents go to get genetic, excuse me, get genetic testing who don't appear to have uh, PP? Yeah. So I am assuming by the parents, uh, parents of an affected individual and they wanna understand, um, I think the same services available for uh, Invitae and Uncovering Periodic Paralysis sponsored by Xeris is offered to them as well, so. Hi, doctor. Hi. <laughs> um, so I have a sort of follow-up on an earlier question. Um, so I um, basically am chronically tired. I, I take a nap over my lunch break. <laughs> Every day I, I work from home. Um, and so uh, in that I went on Caveus when I was 18, um, and I'm, I'm still on it. Um, and, you know, when I was in college, I kind of blamed it on, you know, being in college, um, but I've been out of college for about two years now, um, and so I, I already take Caveus, um, and you, you know, said, you know, try, maybe try a drug um, like Caveus. Would you, so I'm a hyper, would you maybe recommend supplementing um, with, like, HCTZ? Yes, so um, thank you for clarifying at the very end because I, I heard all about the fatigue, weakness, you know, when it started and it's your own caveus, but it's important to know which underlying variant of periodic paralysis was. And so if, if it's confirmed uh, genetically or by blood levels and everything else, then yes. Um, so taking little snacks, take it, I mean, we've heard about the balance between excessive carbohydrates and good health and everything else, but a little snack 
even after lunch when you, the tired period would come, or yes, uh, a potassium wasting diuretic like a thiazide diuretic would certainly be worth trying, absolutely. And they could be taken at the same time as caveus. They're taken together. Does PP skip generations? So the form, all forms of periodic paralysis are inherited as autosomal dominant traits, which means they shouldn't skip with the caveat that particularly in women with hypo-PP, many of them have very mild symptoms or unrecognized symptoms. And so it could look like it skipped a generation uh, because of that phenomenon. Hi, um, I have hyperkalemic, and uh, so does my father and my grandmother and my daughter and everybody. And my father and I both have a chronically elevated A1C at about six. That seems unresponsive to diet and exercise or whether we're being really strict or letting ourselves go, it stays at six. And since it's related to insulin and glucose, glucose uptake and potassium and all these things are intertwined, uh, is it possible that the, this A1C of six is, is a side effect of like a mildly elevated blood glucose relative to the disease? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, you know, hemoglobin A1C is measuring sugar that gets attached to uh, the hemoglobin molecule, which is kind of a time averaged view of what your glucose status is. And the connection between carbohydrates and periodic paralysis is really the carbohydrates and the insulin signaling being one of the inputs as a trigger. There's no evidence that I'm aware of, of going backwards the other way. So if you have a form of periodic paralysis, are you gonna have altered insulin signaling, altered glucose control, things like that? I'm not aware of that being uh, consistently demonstrated. Although it is interesting that skeletal muscle is, and liver are the two major targets for insulin and the major way of regulating um, you know, glucose. So it's, it's conceivable that, that um, you know, something like this could happen, but it's not something I'm aware of or have seen pop up before in the literature. So it's not expected, for example, that someone with periodic paralysis, hyper-PP, is at more risk of developing late onset type two diabetes or something, that association is not there. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, we'll try to get through three more that came from in here uh, before we get to break here in just a minute. And healthy individuals, how much does serum potassium level vary hour to hour? Yeah. So in healthy individuals, uh, it's relatively constant, but it's subject to external pressure. So as you saw, when you exercise in minutes, you can increase your potassium by two. But you know, sitting at rest in bed or something, it's going to be relatively stable, probably within you know, 0.2 or 0.4 milliequivalents per liter um, over hours. So it's all context dependent in normals. Any studies on excitotoxins causing attacks? Yeah, so in primary periodic paralysis, as indicated in the word primary, these are all genetically based ion channel disorders of skeletal muscle. While there are many toxins out there whose target is an ion channel, that would be a transient difficulty either with nerve, muscle, or heart that as the toxin washes out or goes away, it would be reversible. So it, I, there's, there's not, to my knowledge, a way that a transient exposure to a toxin would cause a permanent lifelong change in a channel to cause then uh, persistent periodic paralysis. I think you've spoken to this throughout your talk, but is it true that for some it can be a slight shift or is it the actual rise and fall in the potassium yeah. number to cause a problem? Yeah. So that's a, that's a good point. It's a subtle point. Uh, the question is, okay, we've talked about the absolute value of your per potassium, its range, but what if it's not the absolute value? But what if it's, I just changed by half a milliequivalent per liter, milliliter, one direction or the other? Is the system more sensitive to changes versus absolute levels? And I would say that's, definitely a possibility in the case based on the work we've done with our animal models. And not only are you more sensitive to change than the absolute level, but that set point can drift over time, again, depending on recent level of exercise, when you last ate, time of the day, things like that. If you would like to know more about periodic paralysis, visit periodicparalysis.org. And if you enjoyed this video and want more, hit that like button subscribe to our channel and hit that bell so you don't miss any future videos. It really does help spread the word. 
You can view other videos about periodic paralysis by clicking the thumbnails to the right. If you have questions, just leave a comment below or reach out to us on social media. We'd love to hear from you.